Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 367. I'm your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com, and we're honored to have with us the internationally revered cybersecurity expert, first female chief information officer for the White House, proud mother and author, Teresa Payton. Teresa. Hi, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. And the internationally revered, maybe you need a disclaimer there, like revered by some, feared or hated by some others. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. But I could tell my mom paid you to say that. So I appreciate it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so we're here to talk about Manipulated, which is your, it's a second edition book. This came out in 2020. And before we started recording, there is uh, as you say, you're working on now, it's an updated version because a lot of things have changed in the mating in such a small window between 2020 and now we're in 2024. This is a new election year as well. Um, there's a lot of stuff about AI, the books about cybersecurity and a lot of things that uh, a lot of things that people should be, like you said, paying attention to. And we now have to be active engagers of the information that we're getting and and learning more to dissect what we're hearing. Because I know you said in one of your previous interviews talking about the manipulators behind this, correct? Yeah. I mean, here's, here's the thing, Barney, is, you know, before, you know, the, the first time around in 2020, when the book, the first edition of the book was released, I mean, there was a problem with deep fake forgeries, but the technology was expensive. You had to be fairly technical to deploy it and um, and fairly professional in your trade craft as a criminal doing, you know, kind of deep fake forgeries. And fast forward now, and you can generate an image using text. I mean, this is how much has changed in four years. And so now we really are at that point. How can you say to yourself, I can't even believe what I'm seeing, reading, and hearing with my own eyes because of the consumerization of deep fake technology. And I'm specifically referring to the ability using generative AI um, mm. to actually generate audio, video, photographs, documents. I can make up um, a post on X and present it to you and say, somebody said something back in this date and time and i can do it for free and make it pretty convincing and i don't need a whole lot of technical skills to do it uh, i know that because we actually uh, pretend to do things as part of our incident response tabletops that we do for our clients so we'll we'll kind of make up things like uh you know the bad guys are saying they have your data how do you respond and so we use the tools for good um, but it's the misuse of very good technology in the hands of people with bad intents um, that's really creating a problem for us. What what would what is the the average person supposed to do with being inundated with so much of this technology right now? Yeah, and that that's really why I wanted to write the second edition because I wanted to give everybody a guidebook, something. In layman's terms, um, I've, as as you saw, Barney, I've got fictional vignettes in there, so I try to make it entertaining. Really unpack underneath all the geek speak and the tech speak. What can each of us do um, to mm. basically spot and stop these misinformation and disinformation campaigns? Because it, it's not just impacting global elections, which is a problematic. You know how people vote, and candidly. Um, many of the operatives who promote disinformation and misinformation actually would love it if we don't vote at all. And, and that's when they win, right? And so mm -hmm. we can make up our own minds. The idea that somebody who is a bad person with misinformation and disinformation makes good people vote incorrectly, um, I don't necessarily subscribe to that theory, although they could make us feel very strongly about an issue and doing it on mistruths, right? Um, but really, in the end, they're making a ton of money based on 
our engagement, disagreeing with each other, saying, aha, I knew it all along. And if in the process, they can get you and I to decide what's the point of voting and we become disenfranchised and we give up our hard fought one freedom to vote, they win. You know, democracy dies a little or a lot um, when we're disenfranchised and and they win. And so my goal with this guidebook was to kind of unpack how the trade craft works so that people can spot it and stop it. Um, that they can make up their own minds. But most importantly, the, kind of the two things I want people to take away is don't allow misinformation and disinformation to ruin your relationships with other people. When I hear that people stop talking to people they work with or family members, my heart is broken because then the mm. bad people won. And then two, don't ever let somebody disenfranchise you into thinking that your vote doesn't matter. Your vote absolutely does matter. And so I wanted to give everybody young and old this guidebook, not only to spot and stop it for themselves, but to help everybody around them, because it, it is a real challenge to you see something. I mean, I see stuff all the time and I think, that can't be real. And of course, I'll go through my processes that I've learned through doing the research for the first edition and the second edition of this book. And I think, but everybody's so busy. Who has the time to do this? Um, right. And then last thing, if it does open up a conversation, Barney, where people talk to their elected officials and say, we need guardrails, or they, you mentioned you're, um, you're a radio um, station owner now, and we need news media to say, Hey, here's our terms and conditions. If something has been generated using um, deep fake technology, predictive analytics, etc., we are going to disclose it. And we're going to require everybody who doesn't add on the station to disclose it. We're going to require anybody who says they're a reporter to disclose that they use chat GPT to help them write their story or whatever it is. We have to have disclosure, and that's where the guardrails start to form, is if we can do this in a grassroots way. If we're waiting for laws to be passed to save us, Superman's not coming. When you wrote this in 2020, did, putting on your 2020 hat, is this where we are in 2024? Would you have safely predicted the how technology has increase at this at this rate or are you also surprised about how quickly chat gpt and and predicted like you said predictive ai and and deep fake technology has become more accessible the one thing that i got wrong is i i knew that we would be focused on more of the deep fake technologies um you know, I, I called years ago that deep fake would actually become a household word. And I actually said it on, uh, so WBT is one of the, the oldest, longest running radio stations in America. And, um, and so I'm on that program pretty much weekly and have been for a long time. And we, we do like, like, what are my predictions, you know, for the coming year? Right. And I remember saying deep fake will become a household word. And this was like in 2016 or so. And I remember Bo Thompson saying, what are you talking about? You know, and us having kind of this conversation about it. And so I, I knew that um, the consumerization of generative AI was around the corner. Um, but what's interesting is, is I really thought, because if you think about a book that comes out April 2020, really it's going to press with finalizations in the end of 2019, right? And so this is pre-pandemic, pre-COVID-19, right. really becoming the shutdown of the world that it did, sadly, and um, and all of the the deaths and illnesses um, that came from that. But as I was going to to press and sort of the final edits, I saw Web 3.0 and thought, oh, this is going to be a thing, and we're going to get pushed one way or another into Web 3.0. And so for those of you that are following along and saying, what are Barney and Teresa talking about? That would be things like a metaverse, a, a virtual reality place where virtual reality, extended reality, today's reality gets so blended, you kind of don't know what end is which, right? Um, and when it starts and when it ends. And I really thought that was going to leapfrog a little bit and that it would actually pull 
generative AI and predictive AI analytics with it. Obviously, most people have said, I'm not really thrilled. First of all, I don't want to wear the headphone or the, you know, the headgear. And secondly, after being locked up, I think we all clamor to be with human beings and be in real situations. And so Web 3.0 is still a thing. But interestingly enough, ChatGPT, you know, all they did was put a conversational face on technology that had been around. And the next thing you know, I mean, can, it's hard for people to remember life without it at this point for some people, right? right? Um, right. So I would say that's an area I got wrong because I really thought it would be pulled along. Um, but now that it's there, and so Web 3.0 isn't as much in the forefront. It's still around. It's not going anywhere. But really in sort of the, the zeitgeist of our daily mindset is generative AI, whether it's people might be using it at a very cursory level, tell me a joke. Some people may be using it to edit stories, do research, organize their thoughts. Um, some people don't even know they're using it. That's the crazy thing about how quickly a big, ubiquitous it is because it's actually embedded now into daily software that people are using and they don't even realize that they're invoking generative AI. Um, that's all to say, again, th these can be good technologies. Technology in and of itself isn't a bad thing. It's the lack of guardrails. It's a lack of governance frameworks around ethics. It's a lack of um, just because we can, does it mean we should use it for this? And then of course, people with bad intents and purposes misusing technology is bad. Well, hey there. If you're enjoying our podcast, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcast platform. Your support means the world to us and helps us keep this show going. We love hearing from you. So any feedback is welcome. And thank you for being a part of our podcast family and for all your support. It truly means a lot to us. Do, do you predict that you're going to have to write a uh, version three of this book in 2028? And what would you think you'd have to add to it? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I'm not sure because um, so not so this is a little bit of a spoiler alert for people who didn't read it the first time around. But I, I remember going to my book editor, Joel, who's I mean, no, book agent, Joel, who's just amazing. And um, Nancy's my book editor, but um, and going to her and saying, you know, I'm writing the book and, and, um, I'm going to put in there a whole chapter about, and so remember this is 2018, 2019, I'm writing the book for release in 2020. And I said, I want to have a whole chapter dedicated to the fact that the prediction is going to be, the election is going to be contested. That's my prediction. No matter who wins, I said, I I'm not totally sure who's going to win, but no matter who wins, the other side is actually going to contest the election and it's going to get really ugly. And she was like, well, what's the cure for that? And I said, I, I don't believe there is one. And she's like, people, I'm not sure people are going to be able to handle that. And I know you like to write like little fictional stories. So why don't you just have fun creatively and just write a fictional account of your predictions because it might be more entertaining and something that, that people can take on and you can, you can morph the prediction and not have it be your actual prediction. It could just be more like a fictional story, like this is fiction for now. And I was like, oh, I think that's a really great idea. So in the first edition of the book, I did predict a contested election. Um, I did not predict what unfolded uh, in January after the election, um, but I did predict a contested election. I did predict people um, protesting um, and marching in the streets. Um, so you know, I think people can spend some time reading that. I do, without giving a spoiler alert, I do give a prediction for 2024 um, if we do nothing. And I give an alternate reality if we all take responsibility and pitch in and change things. Um, so long answer to your question, Barney, but yeah, there probably will be... Um, a need to talk about a 2028 version um, and probably a complete and total rewrite at that point uh, because of the speed of technology and what operatives are getting away with. I mean, that's the other thing too. Right. How many people can you count um, have been one charged and indicted? There is a group, there's a group of Russians who are charged and indicted with misinformation and propaganda campaigns. 
Um, how many people are serving time in jail though? And then, um, you know, what, what is the disincentive right now for platforms to allow it to propagate and for the misinformation and disinformation peddlers? You know, one of the mm. things that I learned, Barney, that surprised me so much the first time I was researching the book was the financial benefit for the misinformation and disinformation peddlers. Every repost, every aha, every comment, every interaction is pennies on the click. Mm -hmm. And what a way to launder money. <laughs> what a way right. to finance other things. And so the, the propaganda campaigns, the misinformation, disinformation, the more you and I either like it or don't like it or argue or agree with each other and amplify it, and it gets picked up by the algorithms, the more they make pennies on the click. Um, so it is actually a financially lucrative thing for them to do. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily hurt platforms in the end unless right. they get caught allowing it to propagate. So, I mean, basically people are financially exploiting other people's confirmation bias then, basically. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's really it's really incredible. And we so post um, publishing the book, uh, I did a research project um, that I covered uh, at RSA Security Conference. And the research project was on uh, misinformation and disinformation around COVID-19. And so um, not to get I know, unfortunately, this can be political and it shouldn't be this was a, a healthcare situation, but regardless of how you feel about the government's handling or how you feel about testing or vaccinations, and I'm not here to debate that I'm not a healthcare professional, nor am I a politician, <laughs> but we, we do know that there were misinformation and disinformation peddlers on all sides of each of these issues. And so we were actually able to uncover um, three individuals who were the source of a lot of this misinformation and disinformation peddling and turn over our findings to uh, law enforcement. And then we anonymize the results for um, a cybersecurity conference where we revealed our research. And um, basically we did a, a, like a rough back of the napkin calculation of the hundreds of thousands of dollars, these three individuals we're most likely making almost like a pyramid scheme of getting people to like fund our legal campaign because we're fighting for your rights to people doing click through ads to get to the news story. I mean, you name it. Um, people were financing stuff for these three individuals and don't even know it. And right. so that that to me was so, you know, who needs nation states when you have your own um, citizens in your own country who are like, hey. There's money to be had here on arguing for and again, and they literally were doing things both for and against different positions on COVID-19. And that's what people need to take away from it is not everybody is who they appear to be. And if they're taking a side on an issue, do your research, do your homework on the individual. You know, what, what other causes did they back before? What are their true credentials? You know, how can you do some research on them? Do they have a real practice, a law practice, a healthcare practice? And, and that's what we found as soon as we went about an inch deep on three of these accounts that were doing the most propagation. Nope. Teresa, how would our listeners um, and viewers say, um, you know, like, help me out, Teresa. I am, uh, I find something online. Is there a website that I can fact check this in real time? If I see something that pop up, is there, is there a, is there a safe place that someone can go and just like cross check information that they're getting? Yeah, this, this is a tough one because we're all so busy. Um, right. So what I tell people is, you know, if you have something that does um, either give you an, a reaction of like, aha, I knew it all along and just nobody's talking about it. And this is the answer. Maybe that's correct. Maybe it is factual, um, but maybe it's not. Um, and same thing, if you have like, you are observing other people have a huge emotional reaction to something that's been posted. The best way to do your homework in a way that's not a big time 
consumption for you, because we're all super busy, is mm -hmm. always have three sources. So pick out a trusted news source that's local, pick out a national news source. And, you know, people say, well, what if it's biased? If you're picking out three and one's local and one's national and one's international, because there's a lot of great international reporting. We do reporting on other countries. Other countries do reporting on us and they want America to succeed, but they don't have a dog in the hunt. And in some of those cases, and some the news organizations don't want America to succeed, but that's a whole nother thing, right? And so if you have these three sources, just take whatever's been posted and just do search, simple search terms and see what those news organizations are saying about that. Um, right. The other thing you can do is you can flag things to the social media companies and you can say, I think this is misinformation or disinformation and they'll eventually take a look at it. Um, if you think you're looking at a deep fake. So I'll give you an example. When Princess Kate very bravely came out and talked about her cancer diagnosis, diagnosis and she was sitting on a bench in a park with this beautiful striped sweater on. Part of the internet decided, I guess, that princesses don't re-wear sweaters. And so they said this was a deep fake video of her, that it wasn't really her because, look, she wore this sweater in this picture from a few years ago and a few years ago here, and it's not really her. And people who I know and respect were getting wrapped up into this theory that it wasn't really her and it was a deep fake video. And so I just took a moment and I just ran it through. There's a free um, deep fake. It's called deep wear scanner. Um, you can look it up and if people can't find it, just, you know, reach out to me on LinkedIn and I can show you where to find it. And Barney, I can get you the link after this. Mm -hmm. um, and I just ran the video link and it said, this is not a deep fake. And what's okay. interesting is, is I use that same tool. So I took a video of a celebrity and myself and I morphed the two videos and then I edited it to say something that hadn't been said before. And I ran that, that video through that same tool. And what's interesting is, is the tool struggled for a little bit because it was like, wait, that's real. That's real. Wait, now it's all spliced together. And so it finally came to the conclusion based on the heavy editing and the tools that have been used, this was most likely a deep fake. So wow. the tool's super easy to use and it's free. So that can be a great way if you see a politician or somebody saying something, you think that's preposterous, then you can use this link and you can do your fact checking. So Teresa, my, ne my next question for you is, you know, taking off your, say like your, your content expert hat and putting on your author hat as an author, what are your, some of your concerns with like chat GPT and generative AI? I, I mean, a, a couple of things, obviously many of the generative AI platforms, just, just like early search days of early search engines, they're being trained on the internet, the open web and and we all know the internet has some great things on it, like rolling pandas are amazing. I mean, who does not want to see a rolling panda? I will probably look at them tonight because <laughs> it's been a pretty busy day at work. A lot of distress calls. There's a lot of ransomware going on right now. And I'm like, I'm probably going to need some rolling pandas to look at tonight. Right. And so um, the internet has these like amazing things. It also has a dumpster fire of stuff that nobody manages. Like maybe there's like a little ring around it, like a fire ring around it to try and make sure it doesn't contaminate everything else, but it's there. And guess what? Like nobody tells Jet GPT, don't look at the dumpster fire. It's just like, go to the internet. Yeah. And just like we try to teach our young children, you know, Barney, you've got kids, I've got kids. And it's like, just because the internet presents that to you as an answer, it doesn't mean it's true. And so now with ChatGPT, it behaves like an authoritative source, but what was the source of its data? I love rolling pandas and I'll take those all day long, but the dumpster fire that's out there, I don't really want that presented as fact. Um, I did a little test case. I'll give you a quick example, Barney. So I actually asked, um, I asked 
the generative AI platforms, tell me everything you know. And I made up a programming language name that I knew did not exist. Tell me everything you know about this programming language. I make, made up a name. And I said, tell me about the founder. Why did they create it? Is it popular? What are the pros and cons? And what are some things to watch out for? And do you have to be a skilled programmer to use this programming language? And it completely made everything up, made up the founder, made up source. And I said, cite your sources. Sources were all made up. And so I said to it, you made this up. There is no such thing, correct? And it paused. So it was quick to give me, you know, Blarney. And then right. it paused when I was like, wait a minute, you made all this up. And it literally did, you know, how you have people in your life that are like, when you say like, what you just did really hurt my feelings. And they're like, I'm sorry it landed on you that way. Like the sorry is really, I'm sorry that you have a problem. Um, I'm right. not the problem. You're the pro right. And so it literally did that to me. And, and it said, I'm sorry you misunderstood. Yeah. And then it basically kind of lawyered up on me on like, if you read my terms and conditions and blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know, this is really a problem. And it just like literally did it again. And so we all have to remember no matter how fast and speedy and in some regards, how quote intelligent the tool seems to be at the end of the day, the technology was created by humans engineers are humans and we're only as good as the humans who have conscious and unconscious biases and the requirements they were given and we just all have to remember that and remember what is the data lake that it was trained on it's not all rolling pandas sadly i think yeah. i think the internet would be a better place if it was really just mostly about rolling pandas i mean look it up tonight barney you're gonna see what i'm talking just type in rolling pandas and You'll be happier. I will be. I, I remember when the internet first started, it was the, the hamster dance. I mean, that oh, was... Oh, the hamster dance. Oh, and see, yeah. now I have that tune in my head. Yeah. See, that that tune that was from the Robin Hood, yes. you know, cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been great, Teresa. Thank you so much for coming on. I have really enjoyed the conversation, and I'm really looking forward to, as I say, I'm cautiously optimistic for our future with our mm -hmm. technology. So and being an active researcher i guess and all things that you're looking at on the internet too yeah absolutely and you know what i for people who if if you want to know if you want to jump to the end and read the positive outcome that i foresee if we work on the guardrails if we work together if we promote critical thinking and digital literacy on all ages and so this is regardless of your your creed and your belief system this is for all ages um, I've got a happy ending for us. Mm. Um, so people could always like jump to the end, read the happy ending, um, and then go back and read what we need to do to get to the happy ending. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Teresa. Thanks for having me. That's a nice, uh, that's a, that's a nice mic too. What kind of mic is that? That is a great question. Um, I have one of the groups that I do regular recordings for sent it to me. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I think it's a, the box that it's attached to is called focus, right? Okay. All right. And you got the pop filter and everything on there too. Not at all. Yeah. I look, I look super pro. <laughs> <laughs>